Good evening. Welcome to Baton Rouge Community College for the special screening of Lorraine Hansberry's Sighted Eyes, Feeling Heart, and the panel discussion that will follow. We are honored to be the venue to host such an extraordinary event and to bring this body of work to the Baton Rouge community. In 1965, Reverend Martin Luther King stated that Lorraine Hansberry's creative ability and her profound grasp of the deep social issues confronting the world at that time would remain an inspiration for generations to come. Well, 60 years later, Dr. King's words hold true. And tonight we will have an opportunity to see it firsthand. I would like to thank Beth Courtney, President and CEO of Louisiana Public Broadcasting, Kathy Schreer, the panelists, Kizzy Payton, and Jerry Hobdy for the work that has been put into this. Thank you all for attending. And next we will have Beth Courtney, President and CEO of LPB. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, Littleton Stibe, I love that name spelled out, and I love the opportunity to be here with all of you uh, students, staff, and professors at Baton Rouge Community College. We thank you for being our partner in this wonderful project. I was telling the chancellor that whenever we have the opportunity to come to the Baton Rouge Community College, we love to do it. On this stage, we have seen a Debbie Allen production, uh, Brothers of the Night. I remember doing an interview with Ernest Gaines, and I hope tonight um, we will have a wonderful experience for you as well. You have a wonderful space and a fabulous community college. Um, certainly, this play, written by Lorraine Hansberry, the play A Raisin in the Sun, the first play written by an African-American woman to be produced on Broadway, was a, a landmark, if you will. Uh, this is part of the PBS American Masters film series about her life and work. And tonight, we want to thank Greg Williams, Jr., the artistic director of New Venture Theater, and a professional actor, Roger Ferrier, for conducting an acting workshop and readings last Friday that enlisted the talents of several BRCC students from Dr. Tony Medlin's class. Thank you, Dr. Medlin and Mr. Rhett Poche, uh, the Department Chair of Fine Arts and Communication, for your generous help in facilitating this project, and to the Baton Rouge Community College Foundation and Friends of LPB for providing the reception this evening. Our collaboration with BRCC and New Venture Theater will be seen on LPB, on Art Rocks, and on Louisiana the State we're in. And we'll be sure to let you know at what point you will be on the air. Uh, we've been so pleased with the helpfulness uh, of your staff and your students. Um, after the film and panel discussion this evening, uh, I invite you to stop by the LPB booth uh, outside in the lobby, or we may be setting up in here to get a better audio. Um, we, we are hoping to capture some stories. We'd like you to share with us some women who have inspired you. Certainly, Lorraine Hansberry was an inspirational woman, and we would like to hear about your stories, and then we can share them on a PBS website. Before we begin the film, I'd like to turn the floor over to my good friend and LPB's good friend, Ms. Jerry Hopti, who's Director of Community Relations with the Office of Institutional Advancement at BRCC. She will be our moderator for the panel discussion this evening, and she has been instrumental in our efforts. Jerry, to you. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. I'd like to also acknowledge the BRCC Foundation and our Vice Chancellor, Philip Smith, is here with us this evening. Mr. Smith. I'd like to also point out we have a wonderful program, and please, please stay so we can hear your thoughts about uh, the film, and we'd like to get that all on tape. So. Uh, afterwards, you'll hear our three panelists. We have Dr. Tony Medlin, Greg Williams, and B. Jima. Would you raise your hands over there and just wave? I'll formally introduce them later, but for now, please sit back and enjoy the film.
At this time, I'd like to ask my panelists to come to the stage, and while they're coming up, I'd like to acknowledge the president of the LPB board, Mr. Bill Blackwood. He is the chairman and his lovely wife, Chris Russo Blackwood. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much for being here. Greg Williams is in his 11th year, 11th year in this city. And I have to pause here because there are a lot of theaters that try to get made in our community but it takes tenacity over a period of time to grow audiences, sometimes with money, sometimes with not a lot of money. But Greg has done that 11 seasons, and he is the executive director of New Venture Theater. As artistic uh, director, he has over 35 productions to his credit, Fences, the Color Purple, Dream Girls, Fat Pigs, uh, Fat Pig, Lady Day at Emerson's uh, Bar and Grill, uh, Sweet Georgia Brown and Shout, which are original productions, right, Greg? Those were sellouts too. And let me tell you, follow New Venture Theater. And I'm gonna tell you, when they put out their season, go get your tickets then, because they sell out. Right, Greg? Right. I'm gonna tell you, because I missed a few because they sold out, so do get them early. <laughs> Uh, Greg has worked with Don Holder, who's a Tony Award-winning lighting designer for Disney's The Lion King, the Negro Ensemble Theater Company in New York City, the Black Theater Network in New York, and the Little Box Theater Company in New Jersey, and the American Family Theater. All of that is really important because he's bringing it back home and creating a place for new theater and wonderful theaters to uh, present like Raisin in the Sun. And where did you do that, by the way? At BRCC. <laughs> oh, that's right. Right here on yes. this stage. And we are just very proud to have you in our community. And I know you've won awards at the state level for your work uh, through the governor's office. And we're just really, really pleased you're here with us tonight. And we'll hear more about your workshop and your work and your theater tonight. Then we have, Tony, I'm gonna bounce back to you. Tony stepped off the Dr. Tony Medlin. We have the professionals here at BRCC. Is assistant professor of theater and liberal arts. He teaches performance art and has been acting and directing for over, he doesn't look this old, but 45 years. Some of his theater, yeah. 45 years and he's with us and we're gonna keep him. Uh, some of his theater credits include Scrooge in A Christmas Carol at the Nebraska Theater Caravan. Uh, he's been in The Tempest and played other with Hank Williams in The Lost Highway at Sart Mars Hills, North Carolina. His numerous local credits include those with Swine Palace, LSU, and playmakers and productions such as Frankenstein, King Lear, All the King's Men, To Kill a Mockingbird, and Noises Off, and many others. Tony performed several one-man shows throughout the South and Southwest and served as artists in residence in several states with the Florida Visiting Arts Program. Now here's something he shared with us on the side but I'm gonna share it with you because I hope we hear a little bit more about that this evening. He also had an opportunity to work with Ossie Davis and Ruby D when he was very, very young. And it's pretty interesting because Ossie Davis stepped into the stage production after Sidney Poitier left and op um, took over the role of Walter Younger um, aside Ruby D who acted in the role of youth Ruth Younger on stage, and he's here with us. Dr. Tony Medlin. And then we have B. Gima. Okay, if you read 225 and all the hip magazines, you've seen her in there. See that face, that beautiful, youthful face? She's with us too. She is the Associate Professor of English at BRCC and the founder and president of the America 
My Oyster Association, which is a nonprofit organization committed to utilizing collaborative efforts to preserve the diverse histories, recognize the various struggles, and celebrate the victories of all individuals residing in America. She's also the founder and faculty advisor for the I2 Am America Club. She established the Our America Writers Project, which produced and published two journals of race and ethnic studies entitled America the Beautiful, in spite of it all. This student-based uh, publication features emotionally charged prose and poetry that examines and celebrates the American experience. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. B. Gina. All right, after those very lengthy introductions, I'd like to just starting with, and you don't have to say everything now because we have a little time, I would like to get your reflections. Tony, I'm gonna start with you, your reflection on the, uh, on the documentary. I'm sorry, say again? I'd like to hear your reflections on the documentary. Oh, I was stunned. I laughed, I cried. Uh, I think it can win an, an Emmy Award. <laughs> That's what I thought. Oh, yes, uh, by the way, what would we do without LPB, NPR, and uh, uh, PBS? I really don't know. I would, I would be an island. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. B? Well, uh, one of the things that I admire about uh, Ms. Hansberry, among many others, is the fact that she was able to be so passionately invested in seeking after depicting a true black experience on the American stage. And with her being able to do this, she was bringing into focus for sighted eyes and to press upon the feeling heart urgency, a call of action against the discriminatory treatment and the injustices that were faced by the American Negro, who happened to be the darker brothers and sisters who occupied the American landscape. And the fact that she was able to create an artistic protest that would allow audiences to actively feel and engage and be enlightened by the different hardships that the younger family, who was representative of African Americans, were facing especially the limitations imposed upon them in regards to the American dream. Thank you. Yeah, it was absolutely beautiful. The thing about me that I love about Lorraine Hansberry is the gift that she gave us with A Raisin in the Sun. Um, more so than anything, I believe A Raisin in the Sun allowed us to expand this idea of American theater mm -hmm. to really showcase the full spectrum of American theater. And it introduced us to a new side of Americans that we've never seen before. And as a you know, black actor, I remember being in middle school, always wondering where would my place be? What roles can I play? And I remember in literature when we first got to A Raisin in the Sun, and I can remember that spark of saying, oh, there is a place for me. There is a place. I love what they said in the film about the interior. Mm -hmm. And you're constantly, before this, we're seeing domestics and vaudeville and singing and dancing, but the ability to see my family, the people I know behind doors, and that their stories are primary and told from our own perspectives, that's a gift. And I think it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So it was brilliant. Well, Greg, I'm, I'm going to mess with you a little bit. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's take you back when you started your theater. Yes. And... In this community, I believe we've had this conversation. What is important? How is your theater going to be used? And keep that balance. Do you find that you're faced with some of the same struggles as a uh, writer and director today as perhaps uh, Lorraine Hansberry was, especially dealing with some of the trauma in our community? I think there is definitely a connection. Um, mm -hmm. Anything in the arts comes with its own challenges. Right. But you know, we're committed, New Ventures committed to telling stories from the black experience and the African-American perspective. So yeah, there's some ups and downs. Um, 
And sometimes you have to be fearless at the time when everyone is trying to be calm, as we did when we did Hands Up during the Alton yes. Sterling situation. Um, and at the same time, we were able to tell stories like we're doing Friday, we're opening a show called Polka Dots, which teaches kids about unity and coming together and how our differences, and we're more alike than we are different. So we try to make sure that I love what I think Nina Simone always said, you, as an artist, you have to reflect the times mm -hmm. and you have to do it boldly. So yeah, that's what New Venture's all about. And it was so inspirational to see her commit to that work in a time when I think everyone else told you the world wasn't ready is when you have to knock down that door. So it was beautiful to see. And we thank you for committing to present us with works that challenge us. I appreciate and that. And share you. new voices in this community. Now, Tony, you teach theater, so your students have the opportunity to really, really delve into Lorraine Hansberry and her other works. Can you share a little bit about some of the other works that we may not have heard of uh, or didn't discuss in the film, especially some of those that were post, uh, produced after her uh, transition? Well, uh, LeBlanc's was not really produced until 1970. And uh, I, unfortunately, the sign in Sidney Brewstein's window, uh, which deals with the bohemian lifestyle in New York City, it only premiered in 1964, and she would be dead in, within a year thereafter. Um, such an extraordinary person gone at 34. Uh, her, well, I believe she split with her husband in 1957, uh, before she became the big star and won the uh, Critics Circle Award and Pulitzer Prize and the Tony Award for uh, Raising the Sun. But after her death, he put together to be young, gifted, and black from her writings and uh, from her uh, interviews. And that became, uh, it ran for eight months as well. Um, it, it, it's so remarkable. She lived this whole pure bohemian lifestyle. We hear about the artist in the garret with the typewriter and the cigarettes and the coffee. And it, she burned bright and quick and was gone. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And she had the opportunity to work with the likes of Langston Hughes. James Baldwin introduced her to um, a president. She had audience with many famous people. But just think of the people she had the opportunity to work with. It was amazing. I want to share something that she said at one time. And uh, much of her life was about protest and giving voice to all people. In addressing racism and inequity, she said, regarding tactics, blacks must concern themselves with every single means of struggle, legal, illegal, passive, active, violent, and nonviolent. They must harass, debate, petition, give money to court struggles, sit-ins, lie down, strike, boycott, sing hymns, pray on steps and shoot from their windows when the racists come cruising through their communities. Not unlike with Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, many of the great leaders of that period and beyond have suggested to us in um, addressing racism in this country. B, can you give us a sense of what it might have been like during the time that she was writing? Well, the great poet Amiri Baraka, he commented that this was a quintessential civil rights drama. Mm -hmm. And the fact that she is giving to the audience a very in-depth and a very intimate portrayal of what it means to have a duality of being both an American and a Negro. And if we go back to uh, Dr. W.E. Du Bois, and of course, she actually had the opportunity to, to meet Dr. Du Bois, and to work with him as well, it's Paul Robeson with his uh, newspaper, Freedom. Mm -hmm. And so with Ms. Hansberry, she's showcasing what it means in terms of knowing who you are and then having an awareness of how others might seek to define you and then what types of definitions you will use to dictate your existence. And so during this time period, we have the Montgomery 
bus boycott that's taking place. And she was actively involved with providing the context for uh, the movement, which was produced by uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. It was a uh, photographic depiction of the different marches and even had graphic uh, photographs of lynchings. So when we look at this play, it's showcasing the realities that individuals are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. This was a form of civil rights protest. It was just done on the American stage. Mm. And this was basically almost like the tipping point in terms of uh, the black uh, level of uh, sentiment and anger and frustration over the fact of having dreams and aspirations and goals for oneself, but no noticing that there were limitations. And what were you going to do about those limitations? And at that point, there was no more of being uh, settled or uh, complacent. Because as was mentioned in the documentary, Negroes had taken upon every single means necessary in order to have their voices heard. And now was the time where they had to march, they had to protest, and this is a form of it. It was just done in a very artistic and creative way. Thank you. And it's, it's interesting that a lot of the issues that she was dealing with as an artist and those issues that she was advocating for, especially how people of color were represented on stage and in the media, still exist. The Black Panther. I mean, lots of those issues about will the public receive those images and how do we claim that narrative and write about ourselves are so very important. And, and, and she did a uh, great service to us by pushing that effort forward, as did others. Great. if you were Lorraine Hansberry, what would you tell young artists today? Ooh, good question. Ooh. <laughs> You know, I hate that I'm just going to use the Nike slogan, but, but just do it. The mentality of her, not necessarily entering this world saying I'm going to be a playwright, mm -hmm. but to have somebody like that wake up one day and say, hey, I want to write a play, and not only write a play, but write the play that introduced an entire movement in the world of entertainment. I would just say, do it, go with the gut, and as with every artist, I believe you get a gift. Mm -hmm. I believe gifts come to us. And if we don't do anything with them, they leave us and go to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I believe when you have that moment and you say, thank you, God, for this, it's your responsibility to nurture it, take care of it, or it will leave you. So when you have something really, really good, like in A Raisin in the Sun, you better act on it and act on it quick. Because I really do believe that gifts are only with us as long as we give them what they need to grow. Thank That's you. a belief I have, yes. Thank you. Tony, do you think that she knew how important her work was at that time or how necessary it was? I, I think that she felt an enormous responsibility mm -hmm. that she did not just talk the talk, her entire family walked the walk. Yes. And I, I think she would be very disappointed in the progress that we've made, the cultural racism that is still embedded in our American system. I can still see that red line up and down Florida Boulevard to this day. And I, I think she would be disappointed, but she would never have given up the fight to try and keep us aware. And uh, I think her memory contributes a great deal to that struggle. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to open up the floor a little bit to our audience. I'd like to first ask if you have any questions for our panelists. I'd like to open up the mic. Do we have anybody here who'd like to, this is how I felt about this documentary. This is what it meant to me. Would you, I mean, why do you think that she chose the last name Younger as, what's that symbolic, as a name for the family in A Raisin in the Sun? Because this was to relate to the younger generation on down the line? Is that uh, something that could have been symbolic? Just an observation. Question. Well, when I think about that question of the symbolism found in the name of the family, 
you have this new level of thinking within black thought. And it's the level of thinking where as they're bearing witness to what generation after generation has faced, but it's a new level of thinking where they're willing to take a stand against mm -hmm. discriminatory treatment and to demand for themselves and to etch for themselves a piece of the American dream. So this is a newer sense of thought. Uh, they're analyzing newer forms of oppression as well as exclusion. And it varies drastically in regards to the mother, Mrs. Younger, and how she's more of a traditionalist, but at the same time, she has a sense of urgency to do a different type of protest. And it's a really profound one in that she wants to integrate a segregated society, particularly with wanting to buy a house that is in a white-only subdivision. But you see within the sun, and you see within uh, Benita, and actually I have to mention this, when I was in high school, I had taken an Akron course, and I actually had the part of Benita. And mm -hmm. now, as I've gotten to be older, I see more of the relevancy of that role than what I did when I was younger. But the fact that there is this new level of thinking where we must demand what we want and the means of which to do that is multiple. It doesn't have to be just one form. But this is the younger family who is wanting to get for themselves something that years back would have been thought of as being unfathomable. This is a new frame of thought, new frame of action, new strategic approach to getting their birthright of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Tony, I see you nodding. Oh, well, I was just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was an atheist. This was a communist. This was a lesbian. What was that like during 1950s? We had 295 years of slavery in this country before the Emancipation Proclamation. Then we really didn't do anything again until like 1954. So it was an emergence. I mean, the night before she and Robert Nemiroff were married, they were protesting the Rosenberg's execution. Mm -hmm. This was absolutely a firebrand revolutionary on the edge. And I see certainly the youngers as being representative of a new way of thought, a new way of living, and the change that was coming. Great. Yeah, I think there might have been. Um, I love the idea of the multi-generational aspect of the family. Mm -hmm. um, I also think it's very intriguing that she wrote characters who were all domestics and brought them into the home and each gave them a role of wanting to leave that way of life. You know, you have one that wants to open up a business, one that wants to be a doctor. These unknown things when at the same time they're all maids and a chauffeur. So yeah, I think there has to be a bit of that. I think the way she thought, um, I've even read things that Lorraine Hansberry based the role of Benita off of herself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so she was very forward thinking. So I, I agree, I think it had to be something. We had another comment over here, right here. Right here. Hi. And we have a, a journalist here. So. Yes, Michelle McCallop, author, journalist. Uh, just had a question for you guys. And you mentioned Black Panther movie. Even this many years later, it seems like African-American playwrights, directors are still fighting to say there is an audience for black movies and black life. How do you guys feel about that, that we're still fighting that fight even this many years later to um, credit or to really uh, authenticate that there is a black audience for black life? I think for so long we've not been able to tell our own narrative that for so long, we just didn't think there necessarily was a place. You just can't say, hey, let's write something black and make it for black people. Mm -hmm. And I think the beautiful thing about Black Panther is that we're able to be introduced to something that we know is us. Mm -hmm. I remember I was directing a uh, musical in the, in the Heights, which mm -hmm. is based on um, Latin and Hispanic communities. And I was sitting in the rehearsal room and I said, hey, 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 we gotta stop. Um, and I, I invited people from that culture into the room. And what knowledge and wisdom I was able to gain 
was monumental as a director because how can I tell somebody's story better than that group of people? And so I think we're in a place now where like this play, we're able to tell our own stories from our perspective in a realm of honesty that I think that is what will build audiences, not just creating black work. Hi, um, I remember uh, you mentioning um, like you had a message for um, young artists and I remember in the, the video they were talking about uh, people who were educated, they had a, uh, like you felt a responsibility to not turn their eyes from the world. And I guess what I want to ask is um, if you have a message for someone, like maybe just a young artist or just anyone who feels tempted to close their eyes, like to, um, like just to hear um, everything and just kind of feel um, overwhelmed, I guess, because I'm sure there's like a side to that uh, too. <laughs> no, um, it's interesting. I had this conversation the other day of what social media has done to the movement and how much of what we believe we are doing are we really doing. And I, I think we're still learning because everything has changed. You know, I'm in that weird age group where I was introduced to the internet but I never thought it would completely take over like it did in, in 20 years. And it's completely changed the way that we react. So in the past when we marched, we wrote, we read, um, we got in groups and talked and demanded things, well now we make posts. And so it's about finding a what works, but I think also it's about getting out of that realm and really understanding what's in reality sometimes that I think that we have to do, we have to find that balance. So I think we all have to activate as much as possible and step out and change the world because in the past year, everything seems to be all over the place for a whole bunch of different reasons. And now I feel like our younger generation is being called to activate and to move but they don't necessarily come from understanding of how to do that. And there's no real clear leadership on how to do that. So it's a lot of pieces now. So I think it's all about us coming together and, and doing what we can do, but I think you have to do it in reality as well as in social media, which is taking over, if and that I, answers your question. On, on, to that point, I, I do have to say that the um, artistic community and cultural communities through song, through uh, we have a strong theater tradition of activism, Free Southern Theater, Dashiki Theater, mm -hmm. uh, Ethiopian Theater. I mean, Free Southern Theater was the theater that took of young people who went to the work farm plantations and told folk who were illiterate, you know, you need to go and vote. They had to have courage. We are in a time when courage is important. We have young people creating um, and learning how to organize in the community. And that, together with some of our strong arts opportunities here, um, will give young people an opportunity to engage. Um, is Donnie Rose here? Donnie Rose, I was interested in, in hearing his response because there is as you know, uh, Tony and B and Greg, there is a huge spoken word movement in Baton Rouge. As a matter of fact, uh, we have uh, young people here who have placed nationally, and you know spoken word, as you heard, it ain't a new thing. It's been around a long time. As a matter of fact, Tony, you worked with Gil Scott and Heron a long time ago. It was Boy, happening. That was a steep learning curve. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd, well, my personal connection was uh, through working on with Ozzy and Ruby, the television series for two years, and that's one of the few times when ignorance was my best friend, <laughs> because they treated me like family, and I acted like I was, and I had no idea that I was holding hands with royalty. I, I wrote down just a few of the people that would come into the show. Mm -hmm. Gil Scott Heron, 
Sam Art Williams, Robert and Kevin Hooks, E.G. Marshall, Anthony Zerby, Billy Preston, Max Roach, Odetta, Sweet Honey in the Rock, Billy, Taylor Trio, and that was just a few of them. And it was like, each week was like, oh my God. I really knew I was in trouble when Ozzy, I was out there working on the set, and Ozzy came in and started sitting down and talking to me about hanging out with Louis Armstrong mm -hmm. and John Kennedy and Malcolm X. I was going, oh my God, I was right out of graduate school. I knew all about Marlon Brando and Stanislavski and uh, James Dean, but this, what a world opened to me. <laughs> a step from the Moscow Art Theater in that world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I knew all about all that stuff. I had no idea who any of these people were. And you know what's interesting? If you look at our arts community today, the names today, the work that our people are doing and our leaders, arts leaders are doing in the community today, 50 years from now, we will be the names mm -hmm. you will be the that names. we look back on and say, they did what we're gonna talk about. So I think the question was about Going back to this young lady's question, what do you say to those who maybe aren't ready? Get ready, because it's your time. That's what we say. We need you to be ready. We have opportunities for you to educate yourself, to learn the craft, perfect your craft. We have folk here and at other learning institutions who will help you think and process, and we have venues in a stage and thank you, thank you, thank you for presenting this documentary for us. Thank you, LPB. Thank you, LPB. <laughs> and my question is, is it going to be uh, on TV for the whole LPB viewing audience to see? Because this is so special, so educational, and so enlightening to me. The A Raisin in the Sun, I saw the very first one with Sidney Poitier. Then I just, yeah, just last week, I saw it with uh, P. Diddy. Mm -hmm. And I thought they did a great job in the acting role. And just to see what the background of that movie is would be very enlightening to a lot of people. So thank you. Thank you. And let's answer your first question with somebody from LPB. Can you answer that for me? Uh, read this, this show has already aired on LPB, but if you become a member of LPB and uh, get LPB Passport, you can watch this program and so many other wonderful documentaries anytime, anywhere you like. I don't really have a question, but uh, I have a reflection on it. I think that we walk a generational line with young folks, I'm not an artist, but as a young black woman in this society, when we walk outside, we have some of those same questions that people like Hansberry, when they walked outside of their house, had. And I think that's so important for us as young students that are pursuing a degree, as young people that are going into this world to ask, as young black women and young black men, where do we belong? And I think that's such a powerful question because we ask that all day and we say that all day, where do I belong? I attend a PWI and sometimes I have that question of, where do I belong sitting in this stage and sitting in this area in my life? And I think just looking at Hansberry coming through and her making that pathway for herself is so important for us to make that pathway and to stand up because we are seeing some of the same things happen in our lives that they saw happen, just in a different light, in a different time. But it comes to a point where when do we do something about it or when do we stand up? Yeah. And make a difference and make a change for this era. Thank you. Now, you're here. You're active because you're right here. You're learning. You're active. 
you're where you're supposed to be. Because when you walk out of here, you know you have responsibilities, don't you? Yes. B, did you want to comment? Well, I will say that definitely having a sense of purpose and being undeterred with that sense of purpose, no matter what the opposition may be, whether the opposition is within oneself, because Ms. Hansberry, she emphasized the fact that the artists and the conflict within, and then the conflict within the everyday world that they faced. But no matter what that conflict has to be, whether it's within yourself, those around you, those who don't know you, but still will give you uh, anger and uh, racist sentiment or may show prejudice to you, you have to be able to stand, stand firm in what you believe in and who you know you are and what you know you are deserving of and to have a level of vision because that's what Ms. Hansberry was. She was a visionary and it takes a lot of courage to have a vision for something that hasn't been done before. And that's what was so revolutionary about her. She had that level of having a deep sense of empathy for mankind. And she wanted to foster a sense of awareness that if we are willing to understand each other, then we can eliminate some of the prejudice that we face on a daily basis by eradicating isolation. And for her as a young person to be able to do this and to be able to have this play premiere when she was in her late 20s was extraordinary. So use her life as an example for what it is that has been placed within your heart to do. And just like Ms. Hansberry, and this is for anyone, this is irrespective of one's race, gender, religion, whoever you happen to be, your purpose has to be greater than your pain. You have to have a level of vision that can isolate you from the negativity or the self-doubt that will definitely come in your way. You just have to be able to know that what you are determined to do will not only better serve yourself, but it'll better serve humanity. All right. She teaches at BRCC. <laughs> That's why our classes are always full. We had, okay, this young lady's been holding up her hand a while, right here and then right here, and then this gentleman, yes. Um, hi, uh, my name is Allison Bloodworth. Um, I kind of wanted to, I don't know if we're talking about um, women that inspire us yet, but um, a woman that inspires me is um, my godmother. She is black and it's kind of, um, it kind of puts you in a place where I go in everyday life and it's sort of, I can't understand how the relating to certain problems seems to be, I can't relate to her problems, but I am transgender. And so I am discriminated on every single day. And it really, she inspires me so much because my, uh, both my parents uh, aren't around anymore. And she stuck around with me and she's still here with me today and has raised me. and in her older age has completely changed my life and stayed around and I just think it's, it's just, it's really amazing. Like she touches my heart and I, I kind of wish there was a more, um, I don't find that there are too many voices for the LGBT community as much as other problems and it's just, I don't know, I, I wish there was more something, a little extra, I guess, to kind of explain the pains that um, gay people, transgender, like you said, gender, race, whatever it is. And it, it is a little bit easier for people like me who can go through everyday life and kind of hide what you are, and it's different when it's the color of your skin. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, thank you for speaking and affirming yourself and honoring somebody who was important to you. We honor her as well. We do. And it's interesting to note that, um, as Tony mentioned, um, 
being gay was something that she didn't broadcast. She didn't broadcast. Um, though her journal writings and, and other relationships did come mostly after she passed. As a matter of fact, she was given um, a significant recognition for being an advocate for gay rights. Back then, it was just gay, right? There are those opportunities in our community and right, 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 right. Spoken word wherever you have the opportunity and we have many opportunities in this community. Um, I would encourage you to look at a forward arts as a way to share, listen and share um, what, you're, what you're feeling through this and, and to continue to honor people who inspire you. This young lady right here. I think it's quite apropos that I went after um, her because um, I'm a doctoral student at LSU and I, my research works is on LGBT student issues in higher education. Um, and I think it is important to w once again add to that to say that um, it's sad that we don't highlight how many um, of our black leaders are a part of the LGBT community. Um, if we did, we'd realize how many rich um, and monumental uh, statements that they've made throughout history. Say for instance, one of the leaders of um, the Stonewall and um, gay rights movement was Marsha P. Johnson, um, who was a black um, trans non-binary woman. Um, uh, Bayard Rustin, essentially, I mean, he, he organized the March on Washington, yet we really never hear his name. Um, Angela Davis, uh, the list goes on. Um, so my question <laughs> was focused more on just the, um, the evolution of filmography, um, film and um, theater through the black lens and if there are times in which the perceptions of blackness are not necessarily positive. So say for instance, you have um, Langston Hughes, then you have of course um, the great Lorraine Hansberry, but then you, can look at others and kind of go back and forth. Um, say, for instance, um, um, the black exploitation period, um, or um, film and uh, theater by um, goodness, why am I now going to blank on his name? Medea movies. Um, Tyler Perry, um, I guess you could also put in there Spike Lee and um, John Singleton as well. So there's a plethora of um, references to be made about the black experience through um, these lenses. However, are there, all, are there some that are more positive or, or negative just in terms of how they're played out on film, particularly um, I'd say Tyler Perry um, from the sense of a man Per perceiving a, a black woman in such a way, um, or John Singleton and some of his rougher, um, roles, and then of course everything within black exploitation could be seen as problematic. What is your point of view on those uh, subjects? <laughs> okay, this was a doctoral student, so you know we had a very complex question. There were about 10 in there. Let, let, me, let me ask you to restate one question, and I do appreciate your comments because you, you remind us, uh, reminded us of some very, very great innovators, especially in film. Specifically, your question is what? Okay. With the complexity of the times in which we have been able to um, produce works that have been very successful in the eyes of most <coughs> Americans, would you say that they are representative of the whole black experience or are there times in which they are indeed problematic and create themes, um, almost in comparison like a, a common versus a gangster rap, you know, a conscious okay. versus problematic? Okay, that would assume that we were all one thing, but. Yeah, you know, I believe um, theater for an audience is escapism. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some people disagree with me. I don't mind Tyler Perry because sometimes you just want to laugh. And all art is not necessarily going to be heavy, serious, change the world. And I don't think that's necessarily what he's trying to do. Um, when I go to see a Tyler Perry play or movie, I will laugh. I will have a great time. Um, have some lines that I'm sure I'll be saying over and over for the next three weeks. Mm -hmm. So I don't think he's necessarily trying to do anything heavy or move it. I do think it is based on stereotypes. I don't think it's all positive. But a lot of stuff in the world, and this is entertainment, 
you know, sometimes it's about the cash. Um, so do I put him in the same category as Raising the Sun? No. But do I do think he's doing good stuff? Absolutely. He wouldn't be where he is if he didn't. That's just my perspective. He did for Colored Girls, too, I'm just saying. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and he did a good job with it. I would say that not all art has to be a form of social protest, but in essence, it should at least give a somewhat accurate portrayal of life. It should mirror life in some aspect. And with Miss Hansberry, her work, as we know, it's a landmark, and so it stands in a category all its own. Uh, James Baldwin once said that one of the reasons why African Americans did not frequent uh, Broadway is because the stage had ignored them, and therefore they ignored the stage. Mm -hmm. So when one produces art of this magnitude, it depends on what their agenda is. Um, as Mr. Williams mentioned, some of it is merely just to entertain. And you have to have a level of discernment to be able to decipher what is real from what is exaggerated. And I think that's what's necessary. And if you want to believe the stereotypes, uh, then that is your own fault. You're going to see what you want to see based on what you truly want to believe about African Americans. Okay. And also what they, in a way, what they produce about themselves, that does bear some critique and criticism. Because when they produce certain works, um, it in some way endorses a level of uh, negative thinking and perpetuating stereotypes. I think we've left the coffee shop and gone to the kitchen. <laughs> Thank you, B. Thank you, B. It, first off, when I think of the black woman, I always think of power and elegance and grace and beauty and originality and genesis, everything that is, um, and most likely everything that will ever come to be. And I wondered, how did Lorraine's Berry, as a black woman, inspire you all as black women? And uh, I just noticed that in the film, uh, she even used the black woman to liberate the family. So she um, transcended that role of the woman as more than just a woman in the house or a woman working, being the maid. She was the provider. She was the protector. She fulfilled as much as she could of her son's dream to have his own. Um, I don't remember the line exactly, but she said something about how it feels better to have a space that's your own. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, and I just want to know how did it inspire you all as black women and you as a black man, and also you, Dr. Tony Midland? When I think about Miss Hansberry's life and the fact that she was able to create something so phenomenal it gives me the motivation to want to create what I envision within my mind, but to manifest it as a reality. And it takes determination to take what is invisible to everyone else's eyes and to put forth the effort to make it tangible and visible within our everyday reality. And that was her play, Raising the Sun. That was within her mind. That was her creative energy. And for her to be able to manifest it and for American uh, stage to, to welcome it in that it was so revolutionary makes me feel as though at the age of 35, because I'm 35, that I have a sense of responsibility to create those things that I want within my own lifetime based on what she was able to create within hers. And it gives me a sense of motivation to know that whatever it is that I happen to face on an everyday basis, it can't in any way outweigh my level of vision and purpose and what I want to leave here on this earth as a result of the talents and the potential and the ideas that I feel that are within me or that others have recognized within me. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, to piggyback that, um, <laughs> <laughs> the ability that she inspires me because to do something, I always wonder what it's like to do something that has really never been done. Mm -hmm. um, what is that like? And the amount of dedication and the amount of investment that she made into her work, just to do something that was honestly a miracle, mm -hmm. uh, reminds me every day that anything is possible. And as an artist, I think we're always built to believe that we can do the impossible. So it's a constant reminder for me. 
And I love another thing I heard in the, the documentary was that she wanted to tell a story of the ordinary person that you just pass every day and no one ever thinks to tell that person's story. And I think that is the brilliancy of theater is to be able to manifest mm -hmm. these people's lives on the stage. And it's what we saw, I think her work inspired in August Wilson to be able to give us a whole generation mm -hmm. of stories of black people. So I think it all comes from this um, first point. So yeah, it, it inspires me greatly to believe that I really can continue to do everything and do everything that I want to do. Including opening the New Venture Theater Including building. opening the yeah, New Venture Theater. theater. We're going to see that one day in this community. Who believes it? Do it? I, I accept it. So. I accept it. I take it. it. Take it. Take it. We need it. We need it. Tony, your response? I, I just hope we're back here soon to talk about August Wilson. That's all. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh. I met August. I got to have him. Thank you. I'm Bishop Ann Ambers, and I was going to um, ask that and state in a question, but I'm 70 years old today, Amen. and I was born. I was born on Sinclair Plantation, diagnosed at the age of nine with six cell anemia. So there was a struggle in my life because everybody kept telling me I was going to die. Uh, nobody really wanted to care about the education or anything. And when Raising in the Sun came to the school, Iberville High School in Plaquemine, and I was able to watch and be a part of that, it inspired me to say that, guess what? I'm not going to die. I'm going yes. to live. And I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Because I don't believe that God would put me here and just let me die without living or doing anything. And then I remember looking up some things about her in the library. And so I started going behind the levee looking at the ships, you know, just like she was looking at the stars. There were times I watched the stars, the other time I just looked at the huge ships passing on the Mississippi, wondering where they were going. So I decided after I graduated that I would study English Lit, but then changed that and went to law enforcement. And now, as you know, I'm in the ministry since 1980, but I am thankful that this came to our town because it was like right in a period just before uh, the end of segregation. I had been able to go anywhere in that city I wanted to go as a young child because of the people we worked for. And then that one day, the man told me, you can't come in the store. And I, I didn't understand why. And so um, that movie inspired me so much to say, I'm going to do things that's going to be a first for people, for our people. And my pastor got me to go, and we started going from city to city, teaching the seniors how to write their names so they could register to vote. And I was 17 years old. I thank God for the inspiration. I don't look at gender. I don't look at sex. I look at the heart because that's where it comes from. And if you have a good and kind heart, what comes from the heart should reach the heart. And that's what motivated me, that's what inspired me. And my question was gonna be, what inspired you to go to the theater? Because we need that. If that had not come to Plaquemine, Louisiana, I'm wondering, how would I be, where would I be today? Uh-oh. Thank you. Hmm. Power of the pen. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the question was, what inspires you to go to the theater, to choose theater to be your vehicle? There's something about growing up as a little child and always wanting to see yourself on stage. And I come from a family of doers, and everyone around me, uh, you know, politicians, preachers, teachers, um, we were always inspired never to sit, sit down if there's something that you want to go after it. And I was so aggravated because I loved my race and I knew how rich we were. And I, I would always say 
we're not a burden people. We are a people that have overcome extreme obstacles time and time again. So I knew the passion, I knew the fire, and I wanted to share that. So what inspired me was getting off my butt and saying, if I don't see it, make it happen. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I lost my hair and I'm bald because of it. But I wake up every day living my purpose, and I wake up every day excited because I get to meet little boys and girls that are young artists, and before they even question where am I, I get to introduce that to them. And I get to give them a platform to see themselves. And I think that we all deserve a chance to be heard. And it's a blessing. So that is what inspires me and that's what keeps me going. So thank you. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Do we have other comments? Thank you so much. Um, my name is Harold Milliken. I'm a former uh, student of the Baton Rouge Community College. I majored in business, and very recently I was able to graduate from Southern University in English. So this coming to see this documentary was very important for me because Lorraine Hansberry's uh, work led me to James Baldwin. And I needed to be led to him because I needed to see another voice a black male that wrote with eloquence and power and one who mirrored some of the same themes about race and double consciousness and ethnicity and learning about uh, the black life. So I guess my question is, what do you think, uh, what do you think Lorraine Hansberry's work has to say about um, colorism. Because as a black man, I've been seeing a lot of um, issues involving colorism in the state of black entertainment. And so I'm wondering what you, 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 you guys feel, the panelists, about colorism and what you think could be done to make sure that uh, people of color uh, are more visible in art. Okay. B, you would like to? Well, when I think about uh, what the gentleman has said, and congratulations to you, sir. I remember when you were at BRCC. I'm proud of you. I was thinking about how uh, Ms. Hansberry is able to bear witness to the African-American condition, but then she's able to bear witness to it in terms of the different layers found within the African-American community. And so when I look at colorism, I think about it in terms of the preferential treatment uh, to certain African-Americans based on uh, skin complexion and the different notions that are attached to that, but even more so in terms of her wanting to have a sense of unity among the culture. That's what I look at with Miss Hansberry. She wanted, even though she came from uh, a status that was of wealth, uh, very successful, uh, very uh, active family in terms of uh, protesting the discriminatory treatment of African Americans. She came from a family of entrepreneurship. She came from a family of leaders and highly educated individuals. But at the same time, she did not separate herself from witnessing what the individuals who happened to be her father's tenants, what they witnessed, who lived in poverty, even though she lived a life of comfort and ease based on the economic status of her family. So in terms of the different layers found within the African-American community, she looked at the American Negro as one. So instead of putting a, a blind eye or a deaf ear to the conditions of those who were marginalized or those who were uh, on the fringes of society or those who were impoverished, she wanted to tell their story. She wanted to be a voice to the voiceless, and she did not have to do that. Her life with the raising in a son was semi-autobiographical based on the fact that her father wanted to integrate this white subdivision. That is all that she could have showcased, but she could have showcased it with a well-to-do family, but she chose to do 
otherwise, because she wanted to show that those that don't have the voice now do have a voice. And she didn't ignore the different sides of blackness. She embraced all sides of blackness and looked at us not on demarcations or divisions, but as one people. So what concerns one concerns the other. And collectively, we then can uh, create for ourselves a sense of racial equality through protests and being able to make our voices more vocal as one. Thank you. Um, Dr. Jackson, I'm calling you. I don't even know Dr. Jones. I don't know if you even raised your hand. Just Jackie, uh, Jackie Jones would be just fine. I really want to also say thank you so much for bringing the program here at BRCC LPB. I was familiar with um, Lorraine Hansberry's work, of course, A Raisin in the Sun, but I did not know her as intimate as I've come to know her tonight. I did not realize that she was an activist. I put her in the, in the same realm with um, Paul Robeson, which is a favorite of mine. I know about Paul Robeson, um, and then our Aldridge, the theater has always had a special place in my heart. Um, so I, I truly became, I have become familiar with her and believe me as a researcher, I will become more familiar with her life. I've been, uh, I've been I, it has prompted an interest in her life for me. So I thank you so much for bringing um, this um, event here and uh, having an opportunity to even take part in some of the activities that surrounded this way, A Raisin in the Sun. I was not surprised um, that a female was, she just, that was illuminated uh, for, I, could, I think for most black families, the woman is, has always held a very strong position in a family. What I most appreciate in her work was that she made it important to, for her son and for her grandson to know the maleness. Even though the black man suffered greatly and his manhood was constantly under um, scrutiny throughout his life, she had her grandson to know that your father made this possible in his own way. And it was important for her son, though he made a mistake, a big mistake, he was still, he was still valued. And we as black women, must, must remember that. We got to retake that, regain that status and let our males know their position and they are still valued and are important. That was the best, I mean, that was the most important thing that I got out of her, out of her work. And as far as a woman who inspired me, that would have to be Cicely Tyson. She just refused to be typecast. There were roles that she refused to play because it did not dignify the black woman. So I certainly appreciate the presentation here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. I can't see every, is Clarence Nero, is he here? Clarence uh, Nero is also one of our professors here who's led a project uh, with our students and encouraged them to write and given them voice. What are some of your reflections this evening? I, I was just basically inspired as a writer myself um, somebody who's a creative writer, and I, I'm an advisor to the Creative Writing Club. Like she said, I had my students write about racism, police brutality in Louisiana after Alton Sterling. So we are taking the mantle and, and, and understand that it's important that they have a voice and they use that voice. Um, writers like Lorraine Hansberry and, and Paul Robeson, and all those writers back in the day, they struggled and opened that door so that they can have a voice today to speak up and to speak out. So I encourage all young people who are here, not just young, old, black, and white, to use your voice and never be afraid and to have the courage to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Right here, up in front. And Bruce, Bruce Morgan, is he here? OK, I'll be asking you something in a minute. I have something while we have some support here. I would like to inspire B with her Christian foundation that I know so deeply. I would like to see you be the author of a book called Daily uh, Guidance. Uh, when you have a, a, you're a book writer, that you could do the book like you read every day, like a biblical verse, poem. There's many out there, and I would love to see you be the author of one. If anyone could compile a book, it would be the, be. Thank you. 
Thank I'd you. like to say that. I have a vision. You should do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's ironic that, that Miss Sue would say that because my mother, uh, she was born in 1945, and she was an entrepreneur, and she was a missionary, and she had a nursing home ministry. She visited over 15 nursing homes and hospitals, and my mother had lupus. And so she would uh, go and visit these different patients. Sometimes she'd go to two, three nursing homes in one day. And oftentimes, if there was a room that was empty that didn't have a patient or resident in it, I had witnessed my mother have to sit down and rest so she could go visit the next patient. And at some of these facilities, she would have a uh, Bible study, and then she would have Christmas parties at a few of the different facilities. But every week, she would write these daily inspirational messages and my mother has been deceased since 2008. She actually died the week before my graduation from grad school. And so my mother, she always wanted to be a published Christian author. And time and time again, individuals have told me, when are you going to collect all of her works and actually publish them? So thank you, Ms. Hilliard. Uh, I do wish to do that, and I will seek to do that in the near future. Thank all you. All right. <laughs> oh. Uh, let me get Steve in the back, and Bruce, I'm going to come back to you because I'd love to hear your reflections after doing a radio show for several years now about the cultural community in Baton Rouge. With this, with Lorraine's generation and the plays and the productions that were created from that era, they were fighting to, uh, they, they wanted to be, uh, they were viewed, they were very dignified acting individuals, and let's fast forward today to most cultures viewing young African Americans today as uncouth, unhinged, uh, with the typical African American male conducting themselves as others view them as in a thuggish, very common light. Um, how does that, as a playwright, I, Mr. Williams, am I right about that? And, and as a producer and director and what have you, um, too many of us today are viewed uh, as buffoons, uh, you know, walking around with our pants sagging, and um, we have access to the epitome of uh, educational opportunities, and we don't take as near advantage of it as we should. Uh, whereas back in uh, Miss Hansberry's day, uh, the, the African Americans were struggling to access these avenues, and today these avenues are readily available, and we don't exercise them as we should. Um, every, just about every little young African American male, if you ask them, that I want to be a rapper, I want to be a basketball player, I want to be a football player. Those are the three, and the research shows that those are the three most top, the, the top three answers. So um, uh, how, as a playwright, Mr. Williams, director, producer, and what have you, why don't you think we see more of this type of theater uh, involved? Do you think that society is, today's society is prepared, American society is, or global society is prepared to accept that because the microcosm that I live in, uh, even, even older African Americans, they tend to shun what I'm talking about. Oh, they, these young people today, they just need to get their act together. They need to pull their pants up. They need to go to school. They get, need to get educated. They need to fight greater for the family. And that's what that generation was doing, and we just don't see that as the quote unquote norm today. So. Having painted that scenario, um, uh, do okay, you? Okay, let's let's have the panel respond to that. Yeah, I think sometimes it's, it's perception. Um, I I don't necessarily see not nearly as much of that as we did in the '90s when we kind of uh, weren't in charge of telling our own stories as we are today. I think a lot of that's changing. When I look at the theater world today, the new plays that are coming out are completely opposite of that. Uh, we have bold, brilliant new plays like Choir Boy that are telling stories of younger black generations. We have Stick Fly that talks about a black family living in the Hamptons. Um, so I think it's about what you sometimes are allowing to come into your vessel. Uh, so I disagree with you a little bit on that. I, I don't think it's that at all. And I think it's changing. And as more of us 
black people are telling our stories, we're telling a very different story than that perspective. Um, this is my opinion. And Tony, uh, would you respond to uh, the inquiry? Well, I see that there has been a schism, and I think that black folks have been actors for so long. I mean, coded speech has been a way of life for hundreds of years. And in some ways, it has split to a point where it becomes even more polarized. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I look at things that, that bring us together. And people are, whenever you're afraid or you don't know how to behave, and quite often that happens because of this uh, coded speech where, you know, a black person winds up in a white world and you will change your behavior because your future might depend on it. When we're able to cross those divisions of communication, I think is when we're able to make those extraordinary strides. Something like Black Panther, I think, is when we have something that makes a tremendous impact on the consciousness of popular culture, that we really have an opportunity to, to grow together so that there isn't this separation this performance that has to take place within the other world. Uh, for hundreds of years, the most dynamic impact that black folks had on American popular entertainment was the minstrel show, and then to replace it, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and then Raisin in the Sun. Uh, to, to clarify, Mr. Williams, I'm not saying that this is my view. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this is what I hear from the older African-American community as I travel the United States, mm -hmm. that they think that the youth, the African-American youth of today, with all of the struggles that they had to go through to uh, provide the advantages that exist, that readily exist today, they think that all African-American youth should be going to school and getting educated. Why aren't they conducting themselves in a more mainstream setting so that we can have more, quote, Oh, Barack Obama's of the world instead of more quote unquote rappers and basketball players and football players. And why aren't we exercising our, af our academic prowess as strong as we're uh, uh, exercising our athletic and our, our Do you have a rapping and what have you prowess? Uh, All right, well, thank you. We have a few more comments. Good evening. My name is Rashida Robinson. And I do really want to thank LPB, and I am a friend of LPB. <laughs> but my reflection, I'm Muslim, and I've been Muslim since I was 16. And I'm in my 60s, and I have evolved. And we, re we evolve in the world. And, um, and I just want to say to this young man that the world evolve in society and make the change for better. And we have, like this young man over here, who, who has become who he is to make the world a better place. We, we just want the best and the excellent of human beings. And we don't want to keep looking and reflecting on the bad of the world. And it's bad in every nationality and every human being. So we want to look at the good. And yes, we do have boys with saggy pants. We do. But we do have boys and young men getting degrees, getting married, supporting families, and loving families in the struggle of life not just in the struggle of black people or African Americans or color folks or <laughs> Negroes that we've been defined. But we do have a society in humanity. We are getting better, all of us, and we're becoming one. Thank you. Thank you. All right, do, and we had a, a, a comment right, right where? Right here, right up front. We haven't heard from you, right here. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, this is my second time seeing the documentary. My husband and I watched it together. 
And I'd like to uh, say that I hear a lot in the audience coming from young people about wanting a venue, not just a voice, but a venue. And um, there's a great need. And I, I, I believe that my inspiration came from a family much like the family that I saw in the documentary. I knew my great-grandmother, my grandmother, my mother. Uh, um, we were uh, f five generations uh, Catholic, but my father was from Haiti, and we were never enslaved. So there's a mentality. But what's the same here in America is that there is a matriarchal society created for African American, um, created for African Americans, and I think our young men slip into that crack. However, I've heard a lot of things tonight that speak to um, what our artists are doing, but our history is matriarchal. So we do see some things that are going on in our community that may not be what we want them to be. However, I do see that it does not have to remain. And I'd like to uh, just ask and encourage that we would have venues that would start a lot earlier. Because young men, young women uh, who are not reading by the age of uh, eight, it's predicted where they're going to be, and that is in prison. And so I would really like to see um, artists who can give voice to the creation and the talent, the purpose you spoke of tonight, that's within each of us, that we need something like that in our communities for everybody. And it can only be accomplished with all of us. So I would really like to encourage BRCC under the leadership of those who are here tonight um, and those who are in the audience yes. to stand up and come to BRCC and ask for what you want. Because if you don't ask, you don't get it. Thank you. You are absolutely correct. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Bruce. You've been observing and interviewing members of our cultural community for uh, several years now. Where do you see us going and, and what are your reflections? Well, I'll start with what this lady just said. And my dear, I totally agree with what she said. And I think that, that uh, it, it kind of brings me to the point I was going to make when you asked what my thoughts were. We've been looking at Lorraine Hansberry from the point of view of her social activism and a little bit less in terms of the fact that she was also an artist. And she would not have been on the Broadway stage say she was an excellent artist. She was able to tell that story with skill. And what I see before me on this stage is that same level of excellence and of leadership as not a social activist, but as people who understand what art's power is and what art's message is, as this lady in the back said, to our broader, more noble aspirations for life. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I'd like to thank everybody for coming and would you join me in thanking our panelists thank you. Thank you. and I want to thank you not just for the work that you do tonight but for the work that you continue to do in teaching educating providing venue and opportunity for voice at BRCC and in the greater community thank you you will see them again and we want to thank again LPB Friends of LPB for their wonderful reception. I hope you enjoyed that. The BRCC Foundation and our Chancellor, uh, Dr. Stieb, please join us again. We have some wonderful things coming at BRCC. Keep your eyes out for us. Have a lovely and safe evening. Good night. <laughs>